Hi everybody, it's John Conrad from Design Between the Lines. Every month I get to sit and chat with the movers and shakers, industry innovators, and lifetime legends of the home furnishings industry, and then share their stories and insights with you. This month, I wanted to highlight one maker designer who's working to shape the face and future of woodworking. Sarah Marriage was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. She studied architecture at Princeton and fine woodworking at the College of the Redwoods, now the Krenov School. Her work is beautiful, meticulous, and thoughtful, and has been shown at galleries and trade shows across the country. In 2015, she received the prestigious John D. Minnick Furniture Fellowship and used that funding to launch a workshop of our own, known as WOO, a space where women and non-binary furniture makers can come together in a supportive environment. She's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Furniture Society, and she teaches woodworking at Wu and other schools across the country. I met up with Sarah at the Association of Woodworking and Furniture Suppliers Fair in Las Vegas this summer to learn more about her workshop and how she got to this point in her career. So let's start at the beginning. I noticed Anchorage, Alaska was in there. So what was it like growing up in Anchorage, Alaska? I didn't appreciate Alaska the way I should have, maybe. <laughs> I was more just angry with my parents or interested in things that kids are interested in and, uh, and didn't avail myself of the natural wonders as much as I did when I moved back in my 20s for a couple of years. Did you, uh, do you have any early influencers when you were growing up there that kind of helped direct you into the first things you started studying and thinking about doing for your life work? Sure. So I, I sort of um, went an academic track into f physics. So physics was what I studied when I first got to college, and 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 then I switched over into architecture. Um, but I would say early influences. I worked in a, an Alaska folk art store. Oh. Uh, and so I learned a lot about. Um, Alaskan folk art masks and baskets and uh, different carvings, bone and uh, wood, and um, that was probably my first like introduction to making. You know, and we worked with the makers and the natural like materials from the area that you grew up. Yeah. Yeah. And got a little bit. Of, got a lot of wood up there. Yeah. Lots of wood. Uh, sure. Princeton Architectural Architecture. What drew you to architecture to begin with? Well, um, I think I always secretly wanted to be an artist, mm. but I was the math science kid. Um, and I was like, I decided I didn't want to continue in, in physics, and I was trying to figure out where to go. And I, I loaded up on math classes, thinking, well, maybe I'll go into mathematics. And I also took an intro to architectural thinking. and. I was sold from there. It was just sort of a blending of the my different interests, the the math and science and art. Now that Princeton obviously brought you to the East Coast, mm -hmm. and uh, you you applied what you learned in architecture at a firm, I guess, in somewhere on the East Coast. Yeah, I mean, it took me a long time to sort of get there. I um, I actually dropped out of Princeton. <laughs> just before uh, graduating um, and then I kicked around. I went back to Alaska for a couple of years and I worked a lot of different jobs. Wow. Um, I eventually, um, so when I went back to Alaska at that point I was like, I want to be a furniture maker. That's okay. what I want to do. That's when the, the, the trigger, the switch was tripped. Yeah, well when I left architecture school I was like, I, I don't want to do architecture, I want to do furniture. Um, because we had studied a bit of furniture in school and I was really interested in this, um, in the opportunity to both design and build the things I was designing and to learn from the building process and have that feedback into my designs. And something a little more controllable in size than a large building. Exactly. Okay. Um, and at the time I was very concerned about um, all, yeah, all the moving parts of architecture and, um, you know, fair labor practices along the whole course of your project and all the things that you maybe uh, can't control. Uh, and, and I figured, well, 
furniture, I can do that. Um, but I didn't know how to make furniture. Uh, I had used a skill saw, you know. Um, uh, that was the extent of it up to before pretty, you got into the Yeah, I think school probably saw. pretty much. Okay. And then I, I moved back to Alaska and I decided I would um, build out a wood shop to make furniture. And I decided to work with wood because I thought it was probably an accessible, or well, it seemed a more accessible material to me than me excuse me, metal or plastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to, you know, buy used machinery and um, make really, really terrible furniture. <laughs> uh, I didn't know how to source uh, material and I didn't know how to mill material. Um, so what I would do is go to thrift stores and buy broken pieces and cut them apart and make new pieces wow. from that material. Well, I know um, you had the passion because I I read a little article, something you wrote for, I guess, a call to practice, and this was your, a little bit of a description of your passion for this. I'm going to read it, if you don't mind, sure. because otherwise I'll mess it up, so let's, <laughs> let's do this. So this paragraph begins, so how is a person to learn about craftsmanship? Is it by reading John Ruskin, William Morris, David Pye, Soetsu Yanagi, Lewis Mumford, or James Krenoff? going to museums and visiting workshops? Yes, definitely yes. But I believe one must also do the work. I know I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said before, but it needs to be said over and over, to be shouted from the bell towers that remain, painted onto the empty billboards of this recession, and hacked into the Las Vegas lights. <laughs> Hacking, I'm sure, has great craftsmen. Well, you're right about that. And of course, <laughs> Las Vegas was mentioned, so that's my connection to read this. Mm -hmm. But obviously, your passion was there. And we talked earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you got to the Krenov School. How? So what got you? At that time, they were called the, the School of the... College of the Redwoods. College of the Redwoods, yeah. yes. Um, so after bumbling around in Alaska for a few years, I decided uh, I needed to I needed to learn how to do this thing, yeah. and, and I needed somebody to teach me. Uh, so I decided, I did some research, and long story short, decided College of the Redwoods is probably the place for me. I went back to New Jersey to pick up my cat and some <laughs> stuff that was in storage, and ended up taking like a uh, six-year detour in, in Manhattan working in structural engineering. Right. Okay. Um, and that was actually a lot, a lot of my design education was in, was working in this boutique structural engineering firm, working on amazing projects like the new museum for contemporary art and other. You were things. on that? That's quite a project. I'm yeah. Sorry. It was yeah. Uh, really exciting times. Um, but yeah, then in, um, like six years into that, not having a degree, I sort of saw myself um, kind of hitting a limit to yeah. how far I could go. and. And I always wanted to do furniture, so I took a year off, um, worked on my brother's house, like renovated my brother's house while I applied to College of the Redwoods, and then went across the country and studied there for two years. You got into making product, making, now I wouldn't say product, art. You really made beautiful pieces. Oh, thank you. One of them happens to be the Levi Leviathan desk. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely beautiful, I must, must say. And it has a great feeling. What, how would you describe where you where that idea pop out of your head? I mean, it was just a feeling you had, and you want to express it in terms of a, of a desk, or what's your what would you say your process is with something like the Le Leviathan? In that case, I was I was coming at the project. Um, I remember I was having a really hard time uh, coming up with something to design, something to make. Um, and so I sort of started giving myself artificial design, uh, you know, guidelines, and um, and so it, that is that piece is in a series of work that I did that where I designed a, each piece about another artist. Yes. So this piece is about my friend Kara Scheffler, who's a novelist and writer, um, and so it's a writing desk that um, kind of plays around a lot with her love of the movie, or the, <laughs> the, the book, Moby, Moby Dick. Dick. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> and, and then I also I played around with the idea of the white whale and Leviathan and um, sort of tried to make it a difficult project for myself and so uh, threw in things I hadn't done before so I could learn more. And for example, a couple of things in that project that, that you hadn't done before that you got into to complete the piece. Um, that was my first timbre door. Okay. That was my first leather inlay. Wow. Um, and then the engineering of the timbre door where it, the timbre, it's kind of hard to talk about yeah. without visuals, sorry. <laughs> uh, but the timbre door runs o up and then over and then underneath the drawers. So yep. the engineering of that was... Um, to pocket it in so you know where it ended up, I guess. Yeah, and, and to have it run into the, basically the table. You know, typically you think of it as a carcass on top of a stand, mm -hmm. but the, the door system actually goes into the into the stand as well, so it's just different construction methods. So now this was an example where you, you created the piece, and you're motivated, inspired by a friend. Were there many other pieces that, that kind of occurred to you that way as well? Uh, sh yeah, um, I have a, a music stand called Fiddler Mantis mm -hmm. that is designed about my friend who's a K uh, Kentuckiana fiddling champion. Wow. Uh, when you're between projects, mm -hmm. I know you teach, but do you zoom out a little bit? I, I you used that term one time, and somebody in a quote, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, to get a bigger vision to kind of draw, draw some things in to your mind for future reference when you're thinking about another project. Uh, is that kind of how you would picture that uh, process, part of your process? Sure, absolutely. One of my f favorite uh, films on design of all time is. Uh, the Eames Studio Powers of Ten. Yep. So, yep. zooming in, zooming out, thinking about scale, um, thinking about the piece of furniture not as an, just as an object, but as a uh, part of a room, and how that space around that object is used, and what it feels like. Um, yeah. So it's something that uh, I'll, I'll say it. We talked about this. Uh, I think it was yesterday when we were chatting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you're making something that you know is going to make the person who inspired you to make that that product or idea come forth uh, smile. Absolutely. I mean, I think good furniture improves people's daily lives, yeah. and and it's super important. <laughs> um, uh, and as as far as like Leviathan was concerned, I was definitely thinking about like how can you make a writing desk that inspires someone to write something beautiful, um, mm. hopefully, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. And uh, and how do you make a piece of really efficient, um, like the uh, furniture that you have when you enter your, your house mm -hmm. that both is uh, very useful but also right. pleasing yes. and. Um, you know, I think all of these little things, just like, you know, there's a parallel here to the to the being a woman in the industry, and maybe it's not any one big thing that happened, but lots of little things affected your experience. I think furniture is similar. Like every piece of furniture you interact with affects your body and affects your movement. One of the reasons I wanted to introduce you to Sarah is to share her story and passion for woodworking as well as her role as an advocate for the community of women and non-binary furniture maker designers. Sarah is at the forefront of developing supportive environments where learning can take place. Here's Sarah and the woodworkers at Woo explaining the significance of their workshop. Years ago, I would have conversations with other women in furniture making and just talk about how like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to just have like a shop that was all women? And it was always sort of a pipe dream. Then in 2015, I applied for the John D. Minnick Furniture Fellowship. One of the things you do with that grant is propose a project. And I chose to write about this dream that we had. These are traditionally male-dominated fields. So this is like extremely valuable for getting more women identifying people into woodworking. Sometimes we don't have someone as a role model, and I think sometimes we also reproduce that kind of stigma, like I'm not gonna be able to pursue this career, I'm not gonna be able to do this kind of project, I'm not gonna be able to develop these skills if I don't have a space or you know a community of people that can support me. 
I was in seventh or eighth grade, and boys went to shop class and girls went to home ec. That was just the way it worked. The possibility of a place like this one is something inconceivable. I hope this becomes a space that the women of Baltimore use regularly and really becoming this space where, yes, we are a building with machines and ladies inside, but we're also this large community. I dug a little deeper into the specifics and future of Wu during my conversation with Sarah. Well, I noticed <laughs> you were quite recognized recently. 2015, I believe, we mentioned earlier, uh, you received the John D. Minnick Furniture Fellowship, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, and you right away used that to uh, support a major project that's close to your heart and yes. mind. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Wu? Sure. So Wu is a uh, 6,400 square foot wood shop in Baltimore City with um, rentable professional studio space for four uh, women or gender non-conforming makers. And, um, and then we also have evening and weekend classes and shop hours for the community. Uh, right now we're, we're mostly focused on classes. Uh, we have two people renting space. Uh, but the, the concept is to have sort of prof professionals in residence mm -hmm. who are running their businesses, women who, making furniture for a living, and then other women and girls um, coming in and studying in that space and being influenced by those women and also just seeing that this is an option as a job uh, and, yeah, and maybe getting a job as an apprentice through the program. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. That brings a question to my mind about were there difficulties along the road uh, that you saw as, I don't know, uh, roadblocks for women getting into this business in a, in, a, in a bigger, stronger way? And were those maybe self-created or were there real barriers that you ran into and had to overcome? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just sort of a... Uh sort of inherent cultural yeah. thing. It's just a, we, you know, the way, um, the sort of system of who works where yeah. <laughs> has been, you know, built for centuries and uh, solidified and, um, and so you go to sign up for a woodworking or um, wood technology class um, at a trade school and you're going to be in the minority. Um, yeah. And uh, a lot of, you know, additionally, a lot of woodworking knowledge is passed historically um, from father to son. And, um, you know, kids from a very young age are getting very uh, subtle cues that this is for boys and this is for girls. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's that is sort of like the, just the, the baseline of how you're how the world is as you try to enter this in, enter the industry, um, and so I think there are a lot of women who maybe don't even they didn't make a decision not to be a furniture maker. They just never were, even considered it. Ten years from now, I would love um, to have you know four successful businesses running out of the space, um, and uh, I would love to have a residency program. So like a some rock star woman in the field there, you know, maybe for a year or something. Uh, right now, if we buy our building, we should, we could theoretically get it zoned for allowing a, possibly allowing residents. So we could even have them on, on the property, um, and uh, you know, better machines. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, dedicated teachers um, who are, you know, very well trained in the field, teaching other women and, and girls and gender nonconforming folks. And I, I also see us uh, hopefully being part of a sort of a network of shops like us and that, you know, helping support that. I'd like to thank Sarah Marriage for sharing her story, ideas, and passion for woodworking. You can find out even more about Wu 
at workshopofourown.com and see more of Sarah's work at sarahmarriage.com. Design Between the Lines is produced by Element Studio with the American Society of Furniture Designers. We're recorded in High Point, North Carolina. To learn more about ASFD, visit asfd.com. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more industry stories of Design Between the Lines.